I'm Dr. Robert Heisey from the University of Michigan, and this presentation is entitled, What's New in Mechanical Ventilation and Respiratory Support? My disclosures are, as you see, I get uh, profit sharing from up to date. I get some money from my critical care textbook. I'm on advisory board for Merck and do some consulting for a, a company called Coor Pharmaceuticals. Here's an outline of what I will share with you today. We're gonna to talk about non-invasive support, particularly the helmet. We'll talk about prone ventilation in the non-intubated patient. We'll talk about uh, post-extubation support using a combination of non-invasive ventilation and heated high flow. We'll talk about decannulation techniques. And I wanna spend some time talking about uh, mechanical power because this is important for COVID and uh, maybe uh, in the future as well, some issues about reverse tr uh, triggering. And, uh, and then finally, we'll finish up with just talking on a more generic basis what some recommendations are for respiratory support in the COVID-19 patient. So here is a picture from Italy in March of this year. So much has happened so quickly. And you can see helmet non-invasive ventilation uh, being employed in these individuals. I want to share with you this picture because if you're looking for a definitive study uh, in the COVID population, we don't have that. We have one trial by Bhakti Patel in ARDS a few years ago doing non-invasive ventilation that showed benefit, uh, single center, under 100 patients, but important work nevertheless. What we do have, though, is a network meta-analysis. And what a network meta-analysis is, an attempt to try to put a lot of data in, uh, together and to maybe make some inferences, even in a situation where you may not have a direct comparison of modality. So you see in the top half here, we're talking about all-cause mortality. We're comparing uh, modalities such as face mask, high flow, and helmet to standard oxygen, or some additional comparisons, one to the other. In the bottom, you're talking about intubation. And so you see the usual meta-analysis approach with the line of identity and uh, you can see the helmet seems to uh, come up quite favorably compared to standardized oxygen for mortality and for intubation with uh, three studies uh, in consideration. Now, uh, really what you'd like to know, though I believe, uh, is that what, how helmet might compare to the newer, newer kit on the block of heated high flow. And uh, so we have helmet versus uh, a face mask. That's the Bhakti Patel article right over here I shared with you where there was a benefit both for intubation and mortality. But what you'd like to know is, can you go direct? And there aren't any studies. I mean, the basic bottom line here is when you use a network meta-analysis, you're saying A equals B, B equals C, therefore A equals C. You don't have a direct comparison. Uh, there's Bhakti Patel's, and you're in fire, in, in, inferring something. So you see no direct comparison, but using the inference there, you say that uh, the belief of the, oops, I'm sorry, the belief of the meta-analysis would be that helmet would be superior to heated high flow and uh, in terms of mortality and intubation. I consider this hypothesis generating, but certainly uh, intriguing and, and worthy of additional consideration and study. All we have right now, though, is a direct comparison of physiologic parameters, heated high flow versus helmet, and of course, you have to uh, care about how you're supplying these modalities. Heated high flow is given at 50 liters. The helmet was given with inspiratory pressure of 10 to 15 centimeters of water with expiratory peep, if you will, pressure of 10. And uh, you see the physiologic parameters here that were measured. There was better oxygenation with the helmet non-invasive ventilation. There was lower respiratory rate and less breathlessness. Uh, however, transpulmonary pressure and comfort were the same. Now, transpulmonary pressure has become quite an uh, important variable, uh, uh, perhaps indicative of uh, uh, worker breathing and effort uh, that might uh, uh, result in lung injury uh, worsening. And more on that in just a second. Uh, but transpulmonary pressure and comfort were the same, comparing the helmet, uh, non-invasive ventilation to heated high flow. So that's all we have for direct comparison. The network meta-analysis suggests superiority uh, uh, based on inference for the helmet. Well, I want to talk about COVID. It's obviously a huge, huge issue here in 2020. And here's a couple of pictures of people face down without a ventilator. We are familiar uh, with the Proceva article and prone ventilation for ARDS has become a very important uh, adjunct to our uh, therapy. Certainly, you'd, you'd hope that you'd prone people before you'd put them on ECMO, for example. Uh, but here are patients without ventilators. And the question is, is this a benefit? And unfortunately, we only have physiology for that. Uh, the point I'd like to make is this was being considered even prior to the COVID pandemic. Here's some non-COVID uh, patients with respiratory failure, hypoxemic respiratory failure, air to guest patients. 
who had uh, prone ventilation with, uh, without uh, it, 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 uh, on its own, and there are physiologic benefits seen. We do have two case series reported in JAMA this year uh, that suggested physiologic benefit. Again, we don't have outcomes, but oxygenation does appear to benefit. Now, I will tell you, I'm aware of no fewer than four randomized controlled trials of prone ventilation uh, in non-intubated patients for, who have COVID uh, uh, hypoxemic uh, pneumonia, and uh, maybe we'll have some results uh, in, in the near future on these uh, studies. I do want to talk this again, non-COVID, I'm going to be flipping back and forth here about post sex intubation support. Uh, in, the, in previous years, I've talked to you about uh, 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 the use of heated high flow in this setting being non-inferior to non-invasive ventilation. Here was a trial like, that actually tried to use both. These were patients felt to be high risk. They were on the vent five to six days. They were older. They had cardiac and pulmonary disease. And they had a combination of heated high flow at 50 liters plus regular non-invasive. This is not helmet for 48 hours. The non-invasive group, uh, got, they, they got non-invasive for uh, greater than four up to 12 hours a day. And it was continuous overnight. Here's the pressures that were used. And they found this to be uh, superior. They had a decreased rate of reintubation at day seven from 18 to 11%, but no difference in mortality. Uh, so flipping back and forth between heated high flow and non-invasive may be better uh, than a high flow uh, nasal cannula alone. My experience has been it's difficult to, uh, to get acceptance and it's a little bit of work for respiratory therapy, but we all wanna help people. And uh, so a combination of mask and heated high flow may be better than just going with heated high flow alone. Uh, there was a paper in the journal in September, which is intriguing, and you don't see a lot of uh, articles on decannulation from tracheostomy. As you know, we put tracheostomies in our patients who have prolonged invasive mechanical ablation. There's not a lot of study, so perhaps the reason this article ended up in the famous NEJM is because it was uh, compelling uh, uh, based on the results. And what they did here was they, they capped everyone for five minutes, and if they tolerated that, they randomized them to either decannulation at a time uh, where a 24-hour capping trial was successfully performed, one might consider that to be more standard care, versus decannulation based on frequency of suctioning going down or being acceptable. And lo and behold, they found uh, that the time to decannulation uh, was much shorter, 13 versus six days. Six days is still a lot of time, and uh, uh, an important consideration here was only half of uh, the tracheostomized patients were actually uh, included in this uh, trial. Uh, patients with muscle weakness and the like were not included. So in a highly selected population, uh, perhaps one doesn't need to do extensive capping trials provided the suctioning is good. But again, this is a selected population. Oh, and one more thing, through an adapter uh, to the tracheostomy, both groups got a lot of heated high flow. And I'm not sure what the, what the, the benefits there were, maybe unloading them, respiratory uh, work of breathing, things like that. So an intriguing article in the New England Journal uh, with a big difference. You know, I have to say, I used to work in an LTAC and someone who had good premorbid functioning, it didn't take me six days to, to uh, cap and to cannulate them. And, uh, uh, but uh, it's certainly an interesting uh, uh, way to proceed. Now, a lot on this uh, uh, year, uh, and in my ARDS lecture on, on COVID pneumonia, and I want to provide some subtext to that by talking about evolving concepts in lung protection. We're used to the, uh, and, I, and, and tried and true, our low tidal volume ventilation with a low plateau pressure. These are static variables, right? These are not dynamic. You measure plateau pressure to end inspiration. And then we talked about low driving pressure, which was a, uh, another static variable, uh, which, which would be essentially plateau minus PEEP, uh, being associated even more than plateau pressure in a post hoc fashion uh, in ARDS patients. But dynamic variables, talking about power and driving power, uh, how much energy is being transmitted to the lung that could ultimately uh, damage the lung. And I, I bring this up to you because, again, if you look at my ARDS lecture, uh, this has become important. And I think just to drive the, home the point here, here are two patients, one with compliant lung zones, one with non-compliant lung, each of which have, uh, have a, um, a driving pressure of uh, 20, yet one, uh, the compliant lung zones are actually being over distended. And in my earlier lecture, I talked about um, Rini and uh, Gannoni thinking that perhaps the, uh, the subtype 
of compliant ARDS patients ought to get larger tight volumes and lower peeps, and uh, more on that later. But mechanical po power is the energy and part of the lung that can cause lung injury. And it may be more important because this is dynamic. It's a transmission of power rather than measuring something static. The analogy here might be static versus dynamic variables uh, for sepsis volume resuscitation. So what's mechanical power? It's got a lot to do with uh, transpulmonary pressure. As I mentioned earlier, uh, it got to do with tidal volume and driving pressure, sparse rate flow and PEEP. You see a fancy formula at the top. You see a more bedside clinical uh, formula there. Dynamic driving pressure uh, being uh, 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 peak pressure, uh, not, not plateau pressure. So uh, it can be calculated. And, it, uh, and I wanted to uh, tell you about something that just came out because I've been following this, this uh, issue of mechanical power for a few years. And, I, and kind of from the point of view of saying, well, that's all well and good. Uh, but, uh, you know, would altering mechanical, would that, would that as a goal-directed therapy, would altering mechanical power be superior to our more conventional static variables of low tidal volume, low plateau pressure. And uh, this is a paper that came out uh, that had over 780, I'm sorry, 7,800 patients in Toronto retrospectively looked at these issues in their database, and they found that there was a higher mortality associated, it's not just ARDS and all comers, um, in patients who were more hypoxemic with a lower PDF ratio, higher ventilatory ratio, which I mentioned in my ARDS lecture, uh, is really can be used for uh, a, a, a descriptor of inefficient ventilation or higher uh, dead space, perhaps with more endothelial microthrombi, a static driving pressure, the conventional driving pressure more than 15, or wait for it, mechanical power more than 17 joules per minute. And in fact, the amount of time that they spent, the longer they had a high static driving pressure, the longer the number of days they had mechanical power in excess of these thresholds were in fact associated with higher mortality. This is not a prospective uh, trial using mechanical power as a uh, goal-directed therapy, if you will, but it does generate the hypothesis that mechanical power and limiting it might improve mortality. Would it be superior to uh, our static variables? Uh, perhaps so, but that remains to be seen. But I wanted to share this with you because this whole issue of uh, spontaneous breathing, uh, working uh, to against the patient to worse lung injury, uh, dyssynchrony, all these things relate to mechanical power. So what is uh, self-inflicted lung injury? The argument's been made that uh, in ARDS, uh, due to COVID, that if you have a compliant form of ARDS, the high respiratory load with using um, transpulmonary pressure or, or at least esophageal pressure as a surrogate, uh, might be associated with a worsening of lung injury through this notion of patient self-inflicted lung injury. So P. Silly has been around the last couple of years. You can see the reference here is from 2017, prior to the COVID epidemic. But this potential issue of these early uh, patients working uh, to breathe and maybe early intubating came up as part of the COVID pandemic. So again, I'm sharing this whole mechanical power issue uh, with you, this whole P. Silly issue, because some people think it's relevant, you know, and, they add, and there has been some advocacy for early intubation of the COVID patient who are working hard. I don't need mechanical power or P-Silly as a to tell me someone breathing 40 minutes ought to be intubated. And I don't need the esophageal balloon, uh, to, to, you know, the wide pressure swings that we think might be in the lung. We're still injured in the patients in trouble. But I think conceptually, these are very important uh, issues. So... Another thing to think about here, going back to our esophageal pressure as a uh, attempt to measure transpulmonary pressure was a paper that came out in the Blue Journal, non-COVID patients, that said, yeah, you know what? This is important, not only for worsening lung injury, but showing that non-invasive inhalation is working. So in this histogram, you see all the patients, but in the middle, you see the, the, the failure uh, to, for non-invasive, who's, um, who's uh, change in esophageal pressure, that's the pressure swing with inspiration, didn't change, whereas those who clinically benefited showing changes in uh, decrease in, in, the, in that, that delta, that pressure swing uh, that would be um, indicative of uh, improvements and less uh, worker breathing relieved by the non-invasive ventilation. Uh, so again, I, not, you know, the issue of um, worker breathing and maybe worsening of lung injury 
uh, may be relevant here. And I, I'm not in the habit of putting a, uh, a balloon in someone's esophagus on non inhalation. I don't think that's going to uh, happen anytime soon. But the point remains the same here with regard to these pressure swings that might make lung injury worse. And in fact, the same thing is felt to be true uh, if you're on the ventilator. Uh, and this is uh, a paper that looked at a number of uh, asynchronies here that you can see on a ventilator uh, studying the waveforms. And I, and without, I can't really uh, spend time going uh, into this in great detail, but the idea here is that the asynchrony may result in larger tidal volumes and lighter tidal volumes, as you know, are bad for the uh, patients on ventilators who have ARDS. Now, in contradistinction to this concept is our ROSE study that we did in the pedal network, uh, which was stopped early for futility, admittedly, but asynchrony was, uh, if asynchrony is so bad, then why is paralysis uh, not better uh, it was, it, as it was not seen in the pedal network? Now, I know Jeremy Beitler was going to try to look at this in a subset of patients, and, and, and I'm being a little unfair because the study stopped early and he didn't get enough patients to look at it, but I think the concept's the same here. The concept here is that um, large pressure swings that could, you could look at uh, uh, using an esophageal balloon, uh, asynchrony, these things can all worsen lung injury. And, uh, and the issue here is, you know, why? Well, more mechanical power damaging the lung. And this led to a, uh, 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 again, these concepts have been around for a couple of years, but with the COVID pandemic, uh, uh, Worldwide here this year, uh, Marini and Gannoni uh, had a p kind of opinion piece in JAMA saying, well, wow, you know, there may be a subset of compliant patients and maybe we should uh, can think about this issue of mechanical power in them. And they advocated for perhaps, uh, you know, avoiding that patient self-inflicted lung injury uh, and maybe intubating early. And in the compliant patients, don't give them a lot of PEEP, maybe give them larger tidal volumes to decrease the transpulmonary and vascular stresses, you see? So mechanical powers went out there for a few years, and the early notion uh, in, uh, in 2020 of the compliant phenotype, uh, uh, maybe you should treat them different to try to decrease the stress. They call them type L with lar uh, versus um, in using larger tidal volumes uh, and lower peeps. And then maybe to not wean them uh, so uh, aggressively because that spontaneous breathing causing a change in the pleural pressure swings as one might measure in softness of bloom, worsening lung injury. Now, in my other lecture, I, I, I sought to uh, describe the fact that this is, there's a lot of uh, overlap between the two, and, and these are not distinct phenotypes. It's more of a quantitative difference and maybe, in my judgment at least, uh, evolution uh, of the condition. But uh, there is food for thought here, and I wanted to trans. Uh, tell you about mechanical power and, uh, and pressure swings and piece silly uh, because it's become incredibly relevant here in the, in the COVID uh, era. Now, I would, I would uh, take issue with that uh, Marini uh, and Gatnoni uh, uh, position piece. Uh, I've got great admiration and respect for, for both of them, don't get me wrong, but I would uh, moderate uh, some of those concerns based on subsequent information I shared in my Aridus lecture suggesting more <coughs> quantitative rather than qualitative differences with a lot of overlap so to suggest to you the following, and this was in Lancet Respiratory Medicine, uh, that we don't have uh, uh, high quality evidence uh, addressing the optimal timing in ARDS, but you know, certainly anyone with a high respiratory drive, and that again, mechanical power, P. silly, maybe that's gonna hurt them, but clearly if you're reading 40 times a minute, you should be intubated. Uh, Non-invasive ventilation has been associated with worse outcomes uh, in, in, in the, in the um, uh, lung shape database, uh, that's conventional non-invasive. You, you heard me talk about the helmet. We don't have information on that. Low tidal ventilation, I argue, is still the king. You know, we've, we, we've had a hard time getting compliance with this in ARDS due to under-recognition, lack of, lack of uh, uh, clinician implementation. And now is not the time, I believe, to abandon those principles. High PEEP uh, should be used in patients who have high recruitability. Uh, again, uh, I, I take issue with having two distinct phenotypes, given the fact there's overlap, but I've always argued for heterogeneity in ARDS, and that includes recruitability. If you look at two of our earlier high peak, low peak papers, came out in JAMA 2008, the Loves and the Express trial, uh, a, a post hoc analysis showed a clear mortality benefit 
high PEEP in the recruitable patient population. So I'm not arguing for high PEEP in patients who are not recruitable, but for those who are, I would do that. Home positioning, I, 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 no one's going to argue about that. I think that that uh, question has been largely solved. And then we, you know, I'm not going to go and speak too much about ECMO for you today. So what have I told you? Well, helmet non-invasive ventilation offers a physiologic benefit over heat and high flow, and by network meta-analysis anyway, with no direct comparison, it may be superior. I would consider that hypothesis generating, but important nevertheless. There are awake prone ventilation trials that are ongoing, and perhaps, uh, you know, I'm, I'm recording this in mid-September. Maybe we'll have information by the time you listen to this. I suspect not, but uh, if you wanted to try this, uh, it's not that hard to do. Uh, post extubation use of non-invasive ventilation and heated high flow are better than heated high flow alone. Decannulation does not require a full 24-hour capping trial. Frequency of suctioning may be good enough in, I would consider, be a, a fairly highly selected good, good pre-morbid patient population. Exposure to high static driving pressure mechanical power are associated with worsened outcome post hoc data analysis, but a very large data set and the first time I've seen, anyway, mechanical power uh, being correlated to outcome. And uh, I think the authors uh, point out rightly so that uh, one reason they were able to find the signal is no one's paying attention to mechanical power as a variable to, to manipulate. Hypothesis generating, could we focus on that and do better? Time will tell. Excessive respiratory swings measured in that delta P esophagus uh, with esophageal bloom may be detrimental and may indicate an non-invasive ventilation failure and May, work, may indicate the potential for self-inflicted lung injury in patients with uh, uh, hypoxemic respiratory failure who are not intubated. Reverse triggering can produce large tidal volumes, and that's not good. Uh, although the Rowe study with earlier uh, neuromuscular blockade did not validate the Acurasis study, I think most people would hopefully avoid reverse triggering, avoid asynchrony if possible, uh, short of uh, early neuromuscular blockade as a routine uh, intervention. And finally, mechanical ventilation in COVID-19 should be lung protective and should use high PEEP when recruitable. And this is, this is not a change in uh, what we do, but is an attempt to recognize that there is heterogeneity, that's true, uh, but in terms of COVID, I believe there's significant overlap between the uh, compliant and the uh, more conventional non-compliant population. And that is uh, information in my other ARDS lecture. So that's all I have for you. And thank you very much.